With your hosts, Lily Mundy, Raj Parikh, and Kyle Sanak, this is the award-winning PRS Journal Club Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the July 2019 edition of PRS Journal Club Podcast. I'm Raj Parikh, PRS Resident Ambassador from Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Lily Mundy from Duke University and Kyle Sanek from UT Southwestern. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Peter Taub, craniofacial and plastic surgeon from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, where he holds the titles of Professor of Surgery, Neurosurgery, Pediatrics, Dentistry, and Medical Education. Thank you so much, Dr. Taub, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to do this. The articles that we will discuss can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. The article that we will be discussing today is a prospective approach to inform and treat 1,340 patients at risk for BIALCL. This article is from the group at Penn State with first author John Roberts and senior author Dr. Patachny. It includes Dr. Mackay, chair there. This article I'll briefly summarize and then we'll get Dr. Taub's thoughts on a few different things. In this article, what the authors are looking at is breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which really has got a lot of publicity in the last few years since being identified in 2016 by the WHO as a novel type of lymphoma associated with textured breast implants. And as this media publicity and patients have become increasingly aware, our societies and certain groups, such as the group at Penn State, have really tried to take the lead on this and focus on improving patient safety and patient awareness. So the purpose of this paper was to look at all the patients that had had breast implants received at a single institution, both for cosmetic and reconstructive purposes at Penn State in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and to contact all of those patients at that institution and to really educate them on what BIOCL is, what the risk means for them, and to provide optional screening and treatment if it was indicated. What they did is they contacted everybody from really 1979 onwards till November of 2017 and mailed them a letter to describe what BIOCL is and to encourage a follow-up visit. And then they recorded kind of the information for patients and when they had clinical information from the retrospective review, they were able to record that as well. And ultimately they were able to contact 1,284 patients or they mailed that many letters and a majority of those patients were smooth implants, so around 80% were patients who had smooth implants placed, and about 20% were patients who had textured devices. They got 76 phone calls, and about 100 patients were evaluated clinically within the first two months, a majority of those also being smooth. And then the patients who had textured devices, there were 16 of those patients, and after discussion and clinical evaluation, nine of those patients ultimately underwent secondary surgery to either remove or replace their textured device, and predominantly that was due to concern for BIOCL, not actual clinical exam findings that were consistent with the disease, and I don't believe any of those patients had documented BIOCL on pathology. So really one of the things that they wanted to stress was that the importance of patient safety in informing patients, and that's kind of what they conclude, is that they say it's critical to really have informed consent, and that it's really an ethical obligation to go back and contact patients who've had these devices placed, breast implants in general, and really provide them with support and data to guide decision making. So that's kind of a brief introduction of the topic. And with that, I just really want to get your thoughts, Dr. Taub. BioCL is something that's received a lot of publicity in the news and in our organized societies, but the incident still remains quite rare. And really just to kind of target this paper and to discuss it comprehensively, one of the things is that Given the rarity of the disease, and there's never been any cases to date in a smooth implant patients, do you think that contacting all patients who've had breast implants at your institution is something that's important, or do you think that it generates potentially more hysteria and could potentially create more fear in our patient population? All great questions. You know, when we do this back at home at Mount Sinai, I always like to sort of give a little bit of background on the paper and, and say, is it worthwhile discussing this topic? And, and I guess, yes, the answer is 100% yes. I think this needs to be addressed. I also ask our residents, do they think it's a good paper? And I think this is a well done paper. It's definitely addressing something that's important. And we also ask, you know, is it by people that know what they're doing and, and knowing Dr. Mackay and Dr. Patochny, this is a good paper from a good group of people. Getting back to the topic of BIA-ALCL in terms of breast implants, I don't know if I was chosen for this, but it's ironic that I was because I happen to have trained in an era where we didn't put in silicone implants. Through my plastic surgery residency training, we only were allowed to put in saline implants 
because the silicon ones were off the market from the prior scare. So this has a lot of import um, that we're seeing ALCL in a group of patients who have already had problems with breast implants in the past. Now, of note, those problems never panned out, and, and the rate of sort of rheumatologic problems that they found in patients with breast implants were the same as they found in a general population. So silicone implants were found to be safe and brought back on the market. And I think we're seeing, you know, safe implants placed. Now this comes up, and this is another problem. It's a different problem, but it's just as big. And I think looking at the two different eras, I think one of the criticisms of you know, placing implants in the old era was that it was fairly unregulated. I think in those days of plastic surgery or, or the device companies had kept very good registries on who received breast implants, what their problems were, when their symptoms arose, how they were treated. I think we could have handled that better. I think we learned from that, certainly, and we're now applying you know, those strategies to placing implants as in, in addition to using fat grafting and all the things we have questions about, we're creating registries to track this data. So I, I think this is a huge concern. I think we need to address this. I think you need to also get out in front of it. I think problems arise not only in, in medicine, but problems arise in business when, um, when there's an issue and it's either hidden or deferred or not taken seriously. I think it's much more important for us as a society, us as a community of plastic surgeons, to take this seriously, look at the problem, study the problem, and then address it. Definitely, thank you. I think those thoughts are excellent. I, I completely agree. I think one of the things that the society ASPS has done and, and several of the leaders in our field have done is, is really try to get out ahead of this and you know to con not to control the narrative, but to really just provide science to it. So you know it's not the media kind of pushing any certain viewpoint, but to really just have good data and good science behind this. I think with the ASPS, with the profile registry, really getting people, people who do these breast implants to contribute, to put in their cases so we can really just get an accurate representation of the prevalence, the risk factors, and then ultimately also the diagnosis and the treatment. I think those are all very important steps. And I think papers like this that address not necessarily the etiology, but more on the patient safety standpoint of how do you communicate and manage patients are, are very welcome in this topic, so that's why I picked this paper for discussion, just because I thought it was really an interesting project. To my knowledge, it's one of the few projects that have been published, at least in, in our literature, that really communicates to patients about, hey, we did this operation and maybe we didn't know everything about it. You know, So I think that's kind of a, a really unique angle that they took in this paper. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to get your uh, thoughts on is, so at our institution, you know, we're very involved in researching this topic as well. But we do probably around 800 and 900 implant-based cases a year um, for reconstructive purposes and probably another 100 for augmentation, so around 1,000 across the institution. And what I worry about is from a system-wide standpoint, how feasible is it and cost-effective is it for providers to contact all patients who had prior implants placed, uh, especially at some of the major uh, centers nationally? And you know, I don't know what uh, your protocol has been at, at Mount Sinai, but do you think that's something feasible or do you think it's just necessary and we just kind of bite the cost on it? Yes, we are addressing it at Sinai. A lot of it based on what, do, you know, listening to Dr. Mackay speak on this, which I've heard him talk on this topic, um, and it's a, it's a very good, powerful topic to, that he talks on. Um, but I think, it, I think the onus is on us to take care of this. You know, cost is an issue, and I, I think we need to set aside costs to handle this. What's nice about this paper is that they give up a roadmap, you know, a sort of a detailed technique on, not on a surgical technique, but on how they address the problem with two separate letters, one for textured, one for smooth, who it was sent to, how long they waited to try and get out in front of this problem. They do bring up the issue of cost, and they say that there is a cost here. Um, if, certainly, if we can minimize the cost, that's a good thing. But I think it's a cost that has to be undertaken for the benefit of the patients, whether it's you know mailings alone or mailings with phone calls or emails or something. But I think each institution, the onus is on them to come up with a protocol like this to address the problem. Kyle and Lily, I just want to get your thoughts at Duke and at Southwestern. Have you guys started to contact patients who've had breast implants placed, specifically textured devices, or is it something that's happening more kind of prospectively as you go forward? Everyone who has that discussion now for augmentation or reconstructive purposes is having that conversation, but not necessarily going back and contacting people who've already had the procedure performed. 
Kyle here. You know, at UT, we have not done anything retrospectively where we've contacted patients. We've had patients contact us every couple of weeks or months when there's different news items that come out about ALCL. We have, for the last two or three years, had it as part of our preoperative discussions and our consent about what it is. And in general, I don't remember the last time we put in textured implants over the last three years since it really started going. And we used to do a majority of our breast reconstruction with uh, textured implants. So it hasn't been anything retrospectively yet, but we have been getting both at UT and at Parkland patients calling us or emailing us trying to figure out if they need to have their implants removed and, and things like that. Yeah, to that same end, I think at Duke, I, I'm also not aware of anyone who's gone out and sent letters to all of their patients. We have had several patients come in over the past several months to, you know, a couple of years to discuss these issues. And we've had patients that have had textured implants placed at other institutions that now live in the area who've come to us with the letters from the providers who put those implants in and want to have a conversation about it. But I think this paper was great, and I'm really glad that we're discussing it, really because it provided such a nice roadmap and kind of gives the institution who's looking to embark upon this some rough figures of, you know, percentages of patients that called, percentages of patients that wanted appointments, what the time frame of that was, so that institutions can really try to plan and, you know, have some general sense of how to set up and manage the influx of patients that would want to reach out and want to come in and be seen after receiving a letter like this. Definitely. Thanks, uh, Kyle and Lily. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think it's challenging for sure to go back, you know, retrospectively. One, you just have to have really good records, you know, and I think with a lot of people, you know, these guys, they went back to 1979. You know, at our institution, we just switched over to Epic last year. We have records that are computerized back till 2002, but before that, a lot of the records are paper records. And if surgeons kind of have shifted practices or if they're no longer at the institution, their individual records are maintained, but they're all paper charts. So really kind of identifying patients before 2002 for people who don't maintain their own records is very, very challenging. So certainly, you know, we've stopped, at least at our main campus, using textured devices almost entirely, and we just use smooth devices. And I think what Dr. Bakai says, and what Dr. Clemens at MD Anderson, you know, has talked about, and a lot of people have talked about, is it's kind of a one-point plan, just don't use a textured device, you know, and then everything else takes care of itself, because there's never been a case in smooth implants. And I think that's kind of our philosophy, but, you know, there's in their entire hospital system, there's 12 other centers or institutions, you know, hospitals, and certainly further out in the community, we're definitely seeing, just like you mentioned, Lily, patients coming in who've had these devices placed in, and not even like six, seven years ago, but people who've had them placed in the last year or two, who are now, they learned either through the media or through some other way online or a support group about by LCL, and now they're really freaked out and they want to know like what's their risk, should they have them transition to a smooth device. So it's really uh, just one of those things that's really interesting and I think more and more all of us will see these patients in clinic and I think having papers like this that are give us, you know, kind of that roadmap like Dr. Taub mentioned are, are really critical. So with that said, Dr. Taub, do you have any other last thoughts on this paper before we transition on? There were two thoughts I have. There was one concern I had in the paper, and I think it's important to bring up you know, issues. In the discussion, they say, and I quote, when the visit was not covered by insurance or when the patients did not have insurance, financial services personnel work with the patients to drive down costs as low as possible. Surgeons' fees were also waived to decrease operating costs where applicable. And I thought that was kind of odd. I would say that if you're dealing with an issue like this that, you know, in the plastic surgery community, we understand how important this is, I would sort of find every way to get these patients in the door. I don't think this should be a financial services problem. I think it's just, you know, you bite the bullet and you see the patient in your office and you try and get this covered. They sort of hedge their bets a little bit on, on you know, trying to get the patients in if they didn't have insurance to pay for it. I, th I think you get them in irrespective of insurance or not. So I think that was one important thing that I thought. And then the other is, it raises the question of what do you do? Of course, the easy answer is to have a long discussion with the patient about what they feel is important, what they want to do. But that is a whole separate issue, and I'm, I'm hoping that the Penn State group sort of plays off this, and in the next couple of years, comes up with some paper to say, you know, these are the patients we saw over a longer period of time, and this is how we address the problem, whether the majority of them had explantation of textured implants in favor of smooth or explantation of implants with no replantation to give you a sense of, of, of what the flavor is that's going on in the community. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think like it's just anecdotal, the conversations that I've been involved at Duke, but a lot of the patients that have come in to have these discussions with us have not elected to have their implants removed. 
And a lot of that's probably based on, you know, what's come out from the FDA. And for a while, we were sort of waiting to hear that information. But I wonder if other institutions are having a different experience. And then having a patient who doesn't have coverage for the visit is one thing for the clinic or for the surgeon, but what do you do if all of a sudden there's a change in sort of the number of patients that want to have these implants removed or revised and these weren't breast reconstruction patients? And then what is the coverage plan for that? That's a great question. I don't think we have a great answer for that right now. That's why a paper like this or the next iteration of a paper like this could be also very helpful. Those are great thoughts. I think I agree, you know, figuring out what to do when these patients come in is really critical and it's going to depend really on the individual patient and, and also, you know, your practice patterns, but also on some of these other factors that you mentioned, socioeconomics, insurance. Unfortunately, you know, those factors do play a role, especially if patients are paying out of pocket for this. You know, we hope anybody's at real risk, then, you know, those procedures would be covered. Um, and I think that's why papers on this topic are really important going forward as well. I think with that, we will end the discussion of this article. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your colleagues and friends and rate us in the Apple iTunes store. Also remember to tune into the other two articles that we will be discussing on this month's podcast. Finally, please join us for our monthly journal club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly in real time with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you've not already done so. That's where our monthly journal club takes place. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Tao, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Be sure to read all of the articles being discussed, including some of the classic pairings from the archives, for free on prsjournal.com.